Hey guys, and welcome to a new episode of the Know Your Formula One track series. This week is the Monaco Grand Prix. It is held at the iconic circuit of Monaco and is one of the most famous races in Formula One. Being French, this race is close to my heart and it is the closest to my home race. Unfortunately, I have never been to a live race in Monaco yet, but given that I grew up three hours from Monaco, I have walked the track many times. F1 races in Monaco started almost a hundred years ago, with the first one being in 1929. However, the first F1 championship race was in 1950, and it has been on the calendar pretty much every year since 1955. With a length of 3.34 kilometers, it is the shortest track on the calendar. It has 19 corners and only one DRS zone. It is a very narrow track and it is one of three tracks in F1 to have included a tunnel. The two other tracks are the Yas Marina circuit in Abu Dhabi and the Detroit street circuit. Monaco is the slowest track on the calendar and it is recognized for its challenging layout, leaving very little room for errors. Barriers are closed at every corner on the circuit and precision is key as any mistake can lead to a DNF. This is why the probability of a safety car is fairly high in Monaco. A lot of mechanical grip is required to maximize traction and stability. This track has not undergone many changes over the years and it still has its very unique historical feel that both drivers and fans love so much. It is recognized as the most iconic F1 race ever and it is the dream of every single Formula 1 driver to win the prestigious race at Monte Carlo. By the way, I will be making these videos for every single race on the calendar, so if you don't want to miss any, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and that you hit that notification bell button. But for now, let's jump into the scene and see what it takes to set a blistering time in Monaco. The lap begins with the track's one and only DRS zone, rendered mostly ineffective considering how short the front stray is. Turn 1 is the site of many crashes over the years. Getting as close to the walls as you dare is the name of the game here. It's full total of Borivage and into the tricky left-hander of Massonet, quickly leading into Casino. Avoid the bump on the left before breaking hard for Mirabeau. Next is the slowest corner in Formula 1, the Fairmont hairpin. This section requires a lot of patience and is only just large enough to fit today's generation of cars. Portier may just be the most important corner on the track as it leads into the tunnel and the track's best overtaking opportunity into the Nouvelle Chicane. Look for the 100 meter board and brake hard. It's common to see drivers overshoot the chicane completely. Now it's onwards to the riskiest corners on the track. Taba is a fast left-hander which leads into the flat-out swimming pool section and it's this barrier here that has become infamous and it is the definition of risk versus reward. Here is the DRS detection zone leading into the final two awkwardly slow corners before drivers find themselves back on the front straight to start another lap. It is Lewis Hamilton that holds the fastest qualifying lap that he did in Q3 2019 and he also holds the fastest race lap from 2021. However, it is Artem Senna who is known as the Monaco master because he has five pole positions and six wins in Monaco. The most successful constructor in Monaco is McLaren with 15 wins. So let me tell you a few fun facts about this circuit. The total distance is 162 miles, which is under the FIA minimal requirement of 190 miles. Recently, there has been a lot of discussion around the fact that Monaco is not really adapted for the modern F1 cars and how it is virtually impossible to pass on this track. Those are actually the words of Christian Horner, who also said that the track should be adapted for long-term viability. It is a very, very difficult track nowadays because the cars are bigger and it's a lot harder for the drivers to go around the track and just fight for a position. Of course, due to all the history around Monaco and just the glamour and everything around this track, I don't think anyone would ever want to remove it from the calendar. I always think that Monaco is such an amazing race. We have an amazing qualifying session, uh, but I also understand a uh, point of view that it is not always safe and and the race can sometimes be boring if there are no passes at all on the track. 
Another fun fact is that obviously this track is very close to the water, to the Mediterranean Sea, and there has been two drivers who ended up in the harbor in Monaco. The first one was Ascari in 1955, and the second one was 10 years later, and it was Hawkins. Neither of the drivers sustained major injuries, but obviously both were very impressive incidents. Tremendous excitement. Ascari has overshot the chicane. The car has somersaulted straight into the harbor. Frogman standing by, dive in to rescue Ascari. He is transferred to a stretcher and taken to hospital with little worse than a cut nose and a severe shaking. Another fun fact is that no Monegas driver ever took a win in a Formula One championship event in Monaco. The Monegas Louis Chiron took the win in 1931, but that was a non-championship race. By the way, Chiron was also the oldest driver to ever race in Monaco, and he was 55 years old in 1955. Charles Leclerc was born in Monaco, took pole position in both 2021 and 2022, but it still hasn't got a win in Monaco yet. As you know, this is a temporary track and it takes a month and a half to set up everything for the race and it requires the installation of 33 kilometers of safety barriers. Lastly, as I mentioned earlier, it is a very narrow track and passing can be very challenging. And actually the race in 2003 had no passing on the track whatsoever. Now let me tell you about a few memorable moments that happened in Monaco. In 1988, Senna did a qualifying lap that was almost two seconds faster than his teammate and that everybody else on the grid. Later that day when he was asked about it, he said that he was almost driving unconsciously at this point, that he was just in a roll and he didn't even know what I happened. I suddenly realized that I was no longer driving it conscious and I was in a different dimension for me and I realized I was well beyond my conscious understanding. It actually said that it kind of scared him a little bit and he went on to not driving the car anymore that day. During the race he was leading with a 50 second advantage over second place when he crashed right before the tunnel. That was the end of his race and he went on to leaving the track not talking to everyone and he was furious with himself. However, as I said before, he's still known today as the Monaco master because he got six wins on that track. One of those wins was in 1992. There was actually an incredible battle between Senna and Mansell that day. Mansell was faster than Senna by probably almost a second a lap, uh, but it was towards the end of the race and Senna really wanted that win and he went on defending incredibly and took the win and it was just amazing, amazing race. In 1996, it was one of these races that was half wet and half dry and it's such difficult conditions when the track changes so quickly, especially in Monaco. The cars one by one just ended up crashing, spinning out, ret retiring from the race and only five cars ended up finishing the race out of 21 on the grid. It is the French driver Olivier Pagny that got the win that day. It was his first and only Formula One win ever. And he did an amazing race. He had the pace, definitely. He started 14th on the grid and worked his way up. Well, here's something that very few people know. Olivier Parnis is the only man to have overtaken another car here today, and he's done it twice. And it was amazing because he was almost out of fuel towards the end of the race. His crew asked him to pit, but he didn't want to because he knew that was his only chance to maybe win the race. And he asked his engineer to help him out so that he could optimize his fuel consumptions towards the end of the race and make it to the finish line. Now, fast forward to 2006. We know how important track position is in Monaco, so the qualifying is very, very important. Schumacher had the fastest lap, but he was still on the track trying to get another fast lap to ensure pole position. Alonso was behind him and he was actually improving on his time, which means he could have stole pole position from Schumacher. Towards the end of the lap, Schumacher stopped at a very narrow area of the track, Laras Gas, completely impeding Alonso, which had to abort his lap. Later that night at 11 p.m., the FIA decided to give Schumacher a penalty for what he did to Alonso, which made him start last on the grid on Sunday. Michael, were you, were you aware that Fernando Alonso would have gone on to pole if he'd have continued his lap and continued the pace? 
Um, I'm pretty busy with driving my car. I had certainly no radio communication. No, not at all. I didn't know where and what and the other guys were doing at this stage. In 2016, we saw Ricardo's win taken away by a costly pit stop. The tires were not ready, giving just enough time to Hamilton to pass Ricardo back on the track and win the race. As you can imagine, Ricardo was furious about this and it was one of the saddest moments in Formula One. How do I feel? Uh, like I've been run over by an 18 wheel truck. It wasn't my call, the team called me, so they, they should have been ready. I didn't make a late call. Nothing else to say, nothing good to say, to be honest. But thankfully, he got his revenge two years later and got the win in Monaco in 2018. Last year, a rain shower created chaos on the track. It started at lap 52 of 78 and we saw many drivers hit the walls, lose control of their car and just struggling to stay on the race line. Strategy played an important role at that point and the teams that had a good tire strategy were actually the ones that gained an advantage. We saw Max Verstappen take the win almost half a minute clear of Alonso and Ocon took third place. But that's enough about the past. I think it's time that we talk about the upcoming race, the strategy, the weather and some of the recent news in Formula 1. So let me jump in the scene and start our drive and talk session. Hey guys and welcome to Monaco, one of the most technical and difficult circuit on the calendar this year. I have to say it's not going to be an easy drive and talk session for me <laughs> and I really really respect the drivers for being able to just do a full race here. A full 78 laps on this track is just insane if you ask me. It is so tricky, it is so demanding, you have to be so concentrated. The walls are so close at every single corner. It is always fun though and it always gives for very nice races here. But obviously passing is very difficult because of how narrow it is. And so in terms of the strategy, it is all about track position really. Being on the front row here in Monaco gives you a much better chance of winning the race than anywhere else really. Another thing to consider is that safety cars are fairly common here. Obviously, as you can imagine, if you make a mistake and you end up in the wall, you're gonna be basically on the racing line because there is no runoff areas. So it's very easy to get safety cars and even red flags here, which can really help uh, with the strategy. And if you get lucky and are able to pit at the right time, it can really give you an advantage because you can basically gain track position without having to pass your rivals. It is all about <laughs> the pit stops. Depending on what the weather is like, I think for this weekend it's supposed to be fairly good, maybe a little bit cloudy, but I don't think we're really expecting any rain. And I actually will be in the south of France during the Monaco Grand Prix, but I won't be at the Grand Prix as I am actually going for a wedding, but I will be able to watch this race live and I'll have to wake up super early this time. So now let's talk a little bit about the last race. Let's talk about Imola. It was a nice race. It was an entertaining race, very close uh, towards the end. I have to say I'm not a huge Max Verstappen fan or anything. I mean, I like the guy, but he went on to doing a Formula One championship race and the 24 hours of the Nürburgring on the simulator on the same weekend. I think he drove like for three hours on Saturday night and then he drove again on Sunday morning before going to do his actual Formula One race at Imola and he won both of them. <laughs> it is just incredible. However, I have to say I was so happy to see that Norris was able to challenge him and it was so close to actually passing Max and that gives me so much hope for the upcoming races. I think the Ferraris, if they can figure out why they were slow on the straights, 
um, I think there will be also more competitive moving forward. Um, so we might be able to see some decent racing at the top for first place between the Red Bulls, the McLarens and the Ferraris. Obviously the Ferraris were not as strong as we expected. There was a lot of hopes for the Ferraris after the upgrades that they brought to Imola and they did really good during practice actually but then they realized they were not that strong on the soft tire so qualifying wasn't as expected obviously and then still during the race they didn't really have the pace um, and I believe they said it was because of their straight line speed. I really hope that they can get their stuff sorted, but I'm really curious to hear what you guys thought about Imola and what you think it means for the rest of the season. So don't hesitate to comment what you think is going to happen. Is Max still gonna be dominant for the rest of the season or is he gonna be challenged a lot more moving forward? Let's move on to prediction time. Right guys, it is prediction time. Last week at Imola, we saw Max Verstappen take the win. On my last video, a few people got really close to the right predictions, but no one actually got it right. So we're gonna try again this week. My predictions for Monaco are gonna be Max in first position. I'm gonna put Leclerc in second because I think he's really gonna try um, to fight for that win. He's really good at Monaco and obviously that's his home race. And I'm gonna put Norris in third. So let me know what your predictions are in the comments below. If you enjoyed watching this video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next video.